Hello my pretties, I'm back and today we're going to be talking about my favorite artist or one of my favorite artists, I wouldn't say he's my favorite but he's up there, one of the most well-known and influential post-impressionist painters and also well-known for being the quintessential tortured genius artist, Vincent van Gogh. He is well known for not only cutting off his ear but also for his bold colors and vivid brushstrokes and um, also for committing suicide, but many now believe that it was in fact murder and not suicide that killed him. So Vincent was a little bit problematic, I would say, and we're going to go into that. He would form friendships with various artists and then have falling out with them. He had a great difficulty maintaining any kind of career or job or relationship for that matter. He was a little bit creepy and a little bit narcissistic it seems, but overall very very talented and obviously changed the world of art forever. So let's get into it. Vincent van Gogh was born in the Netherlands on March the 30th of 1853. And he was the oldest of six children. His father was a Protestant pastor and um, he was quiet. His mom was a homemaker. He was a quiet child. Um, he spent a lot of his free time wandering in nature. Um, he loved to observe the countryside and to just be in nature and be by himself. His uncle, whose name was also Vincent, um, was working in The Hague at an art dealer called Gupin & Co. And he, at 16, decided to become an apprentice there and sort of work for his uncle. And he worked there um, in the London branch from 1873 to 1875. And then in Paris... Um, from 1875 until 1876. There he became very engrossed with a lot of other Dutch artists such as Rembrandt and Franhals and um, he also liked French painters um, like Jean-Francois Millet and he was very influenced by these artists and started really kind of developing his art style from there but he really, really did not like the job of art dealing and he eventually got fired because he made disparaging remarks about the art that he was supposed to be selling. He also fell in love with a girl in London in 1874, but she rejected his advances, after which he became increasingly solitary. After being fired from his job, he then worked for a bookseller back in the Netherlands. But he didn't enjoy this very much and decided to enter the ministry like his dad. So he took up theology and then abandoned this project in 1878, so less than a year later, because he decided to start training as an evangelist in Brussels. But Vincent also had a problem with authority and he had a problem with their doctrinal approach, so he had some conflicts with the authorities there. And because of that, he didn't get an appointment, a permanent appointment, after the three-month period of training. So he left, and he decided to be a missionary instead. For his mission work, he chose to go stay at an impoverished coal mining town in southwest Belgium. And he lived among the poor people there. I think he drew some of them. And he was known as the coal mine Christ by them. He gave away all of his worldly possessions to them. And basically lived as a martyr. And the church then dismissed him and told him that he needed to leave. Because he was living as a martyr and taking the interpretations of Christian teachings far too literally, but he was generally somebody who felt that he was a savior and a rescuer, and you can kind of see that in his romantic relationships and pursuits as well. For example, 
he fell in love with his own cousin. I think she was his cousin by marriage, but still. Her husband had just died, so she was staying with his family in her period of mourning, and she was there with her young son. And she was basically kind to Vincent. She would sometimes go for walks with him in the countryside, as he liked to do. And then he fell madly in love with her and proposed to her, and she refused him, but he just would not take no for an answer. He even went to her house and put his hand in a candle flame, um, insisting that he speak to her for as long as, only as long as his hand was on the candle. He was turned away, and um, this was a cause of great embarrassment to his parents. He also tried to rescue a sex worker who was pregnant at the time and had a young child, and he moved her into his small studio. His parents also did not approve of this, and that also ended unhappily, and eventually he moved out on his own. But it was clear that he felt pity for people like sex workers and in a way looked down on them and saw them as having to be rescued by him. The only constant really in his life was his very close relationship with his younger brother, Theo. Theo really took care of Vincent both financially and emotionally and they were very, very close After Vincent was dismissed as a missionary, he then started to pursue his artistic career. And this was obviously great for the art world because he produced some incredible pieces. And the interesting thing is that his artistic career was very, very short. It lasted only 10 years from 1880 to 1890. He started off being tutored and kind of mentored by painters such as Anton Mauve, who was a Dutch landscape painter, Um, and he also enrolled in an art school, but he sort of didn't get along with or really agree with their study methodology, so he left, and then he joined his brother Theo, who was also working for his, um, his uncle Vincent's art dealership at that point in Paris. So he moved to Paris to join Theo, And there he met Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, Paul Gongouin, and um, others who played huge historic roles in modern art and are artistic geniuses in their own right. And they really kind of influenced him um, specifically to um, sort of post-impressionist ways of thinking. Now, it's important to note what kind of was happening in the art world at that time and why Van Gogh and other post-impressionists were not very popular and they were kind of looked down upon in the art world. So before post-impressionist, we had impressionist. Before impressionist, we had more classical art. Now, the classical art of the time was based around themes of kind of historical importance, so things like war and um, battles and parties and just important historical moments, stories, legends, etc. And the painting was very kind of smooth. Artists hid their brushstrokes. They tried to blend it and make it as kind of high, as smooth as possible and hide the artist's um, influence in hand completely. And um, the Impressionists kind of came along and said that, you know, there's beauty all around us and we don't have to capture it so specifically. So they started painting in nature. And one of the best examples of this is Claude Monet, who you can actually look at his paintings of nature and landscapes and looking at the beautiful colors and the intricate brushwork where you can actually see more of the brushstrokes, the very um, cu- the very sort of heavy influence of um, shadows and different times of day and how the different times of day change a landscape and change nature. So they were painting more from life um, and painting more everyday scenes, but also not hiding the artist's influence. But they were still painting in very kind of realistic colors and what would be true to nature and true to the time of day. And now at first, Impressionists were also kind of ridiculed and looked down upon by the classical artists of the time. But at the time of Van Gogh, Impressionists were really kind of finding their feet and they were very popular and um, people were kind of looking up to Impressionists as the 
modern um, kind of geniuses of the time. So the post-impressionists were ridiculed at the time because they decided to move away from these kind of realistic, more muted colors, and they moved further into the bold brushwork that the post that the impressionists had actually begun. So when it comes to the color of the paintings, there are bolder colors. They don't stick to what you might see um, realistically. It was more kind of a representation of what you saw, but they kind of used their own imagination and brought it out and made it bolder, more vivid. And then the brushstrokes, they also, you could actually see at this point, um, they started using thick impasto, which is when you can actually see the texture of the paint on the canvas. So they started using those techniques. And this was looked down upon. It was not seen as very um, advanced or sophisticated in the art world. And that's why um, Van Gogh and his contemporaries were not very popular. So Van Gogh became very good friends with some of the artists I mentioned. And um, there are even some portraits of Vincent Van Gogh by these artists that you can find. Um, one of his closest relationships was with Paul Gauguin. And they had a very kind of good relationship at first. They were good friends, but then they had a falling out and Paul actually left. And Vincent was pretty distraught. And this was at the time that he cut his own ear off and mailed it to a sex worker. Due to his mental health issues, he spent some time in an asylum and some of his most beautiful and famous works were actually created in that asylum. In 1888, he decided to move to Provence out of Paris and to go live in the countryside because he was tired of the city life. And he um, made some portraits, which we can see, but also just numerous kind of scenes of the scenery, uh, fruit trees, blossoms, wheat fields, really truly, truly beautiful um, paintings. And um, this is actually where Gogwan joined him and they had the falling out and he cut off his ear and all of that stuff happened. He was sending his paintings to his brother, Theo, who had become quite um, advanced in, in the ranks in the art dealership, but he only managed to sell one painting in his life. In 1890, he went to go visit his brother, Theo, in Paris and um, with Theo was his wife, Joanna, and their baby son, who was also named Vincent after his uncle. And this was the last time that Theo would see his brother before he was shot. Um, at this point, Vincent was still very depressed. He was struggling a lot with mental health. And he wrote to his brother that he feels like a failure and that this would be his destiny, and that he would accept that because it would never change. Despite feeling this way, he did still work and work hard um, once he got back to where he was living in Provence. But on the 27th of July, 1890, he was shot in the stomach and he passed away two days later on the 29th of July, 1890, in his room. Very sadly, Theo died six months later, and his widow, then knowing the relationship between the brothers, how much they loved each other, how much Theo had loved Vincent and had wanted to see him succeed, she worked so hard to get him that recognition, to get his paintings seen, to get him into galleries, and she is single-handedly the reason why we can appreciate the works of Vincent van Gogh today. And that's the end of the story, or is it? So for many, many years, people believe that Vincent van Gogh committed suicide because he said he committed suicide. He said he tried to kill himself when he returned from the field where he had gone to paint with a bullet wound. He said he had tried to commit suicide, but he did not have... A gun. He didn't have a gun in his possession, so why would he have shot himself? And some experts believe that he was shot by accident by boys who had a gun and were taunting him in the field where he was painting that day. 
Moreover, he had actually ordered more paint and art supplies the day before his death, which would be unusual if he was planning on killing himself. His wound was also very unusual um, for somebody who was trying to commit suicide. And the only testimony of his admission that he was trying to kill himself came from the innkeeper where he was staying, daughter, who changed her testimony at least three times when she was questioned. So then who killed him? According to the experts who have done the research and who believe that he was murdered, he was killed by a 16-year-old well-known bully in the area named René Sekhatan, who was the son of a powerful businessman in the area. He had a revolver and he also had a gang of friends who would make a habit of troubling weak and helpless people and making fun of them and just making their life difficult. Because Van Gogh was lonely, he was weak, he would be an easy target because René actually pretended to befriend Vincent in private, but he was mocking him in public. He would play pranks on him by spoiling his paintings, throwing away his paints. Um, he even put snakes in his paint box. Van Gogh was in a very fragile mental state and this was taking a toll on him and the authors believe that the pranks went a bit too far and that it resulted in the shooting of Vincent. But why would Vincent admit to trying to kill himself if somebody else had done that? Well there might be evidence that he had done that before Remember when I said he had a falling out with Paul Gogwan and he cut off his own ear? Well, there is actually evidence um, by 21st century art historians who looked at police records and concluded that it was actually Paul Gogwan who cut off Van Gogh's ear with a sword and that Van Gogh took responsibility for that and let his friend off the hook to return to Paris. His bullet, well, the bullet that shot him, never left his body, which means that he must have been shot from some distance. The gun was never found, and neither was the easel that he had actually taken with him to paint that day. In the days that followed Van Gogh's death, uh, René's father took both his sons to Paris, and when they returned, René's revolver would never be seen again. If he was, in fact, murdered, Vincent took that secret with him to the grave, and as did René and his family. At the time of his death, Vincent van Gogh was only 37 years old. It is lucky that he took a few days to die because it took some time for his brother to have been able to get to his side, and he died in his brother's arms in the morning of the 29th of July. He left behind nearly 1,300 works of art on paper and more than 850 paintings. So what really happened that day? We may never know for sure. But regardless, the legacy of Vincent van Gogh will live forever through his beautiful paintings that changed not only the world of art, but the world of design and of culture forever. And that's the end of our story. Thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next time. Take me back to a place where I felt at home. Take me back to a day when we weren't alone. Take me back.